This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie with fifty million reasons why salvation is by faith alone in christ alone by grace alone a sovereign god give faith to man salvation's in the maker's hand this gospel offends rome today they offer up Another way, a counterfeit, a compromise Beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Hello everybody and welcome to a new video from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This is going to be the next reading of the wonderful book History of the Inquisition by Philip van Limborch from 1692. A quite very, very old book. Yeah, I don't know if I said it already in the reading before, otherwise I'm going to tell you right now. A few days ago I found the website where the book was available for quite some interesting price and um, therefore I ordered it and that book will come to me within uh, the next two weeks it will be delivered until the 20 uh, until the 7th of April they told me and today we have the 28th of March so let's see if that little more than one week uh, will suffice to get the book and then I hope that I can do a little better reading than from this PDF because this PDF really is hard to read sometimes the printing <coughs> the electronic printing is not that well so I have a little problem with that. Um, on the other hand, also, I have a little problem with what we are reading right now. I mean, I don't have a problem, but I just want to make a point here. Um, in the last reading, we were reading about uh, Calvin and his persecution. Um, well, the book of the history of Inquisition deals mostly with the Inquisition that was performed by the Antichrist, biblical, historical and prophetic antichrist of the Bible, the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy, <coughs> against the real Bible-believing true Christians. Now we have seen that Calvin persecuted and got to be executed, Severitus, uh, something that I didn't know of, but a lot of people uh, who watch these videos probably knew about it. I tell you, I'm not that long a Christian. I did not have that knowledge of that history. I didn't know that. But still, then, this persecution that Calvin did does to me not count as Inquisition. 
because the Inquisition is the torture and the motto convert or die and even not that but even just confess and die because it doesn't even matter if you confess that you are a Bible believing Christian and say okay I repent of that now I'm a Roman Catholic you will be killed anyway that was what the Inquisition did and this is something that we haven't dealt with yet we have dealt with the in with the so-called persecution from the heathens among the heathens and then from the heathens among uh, among the Christians a little bit but also that not very far and I hope that the farther we go into that book we will learn what the Inquisition really is all about. Now, I don't want to play down what uh, Calvin did, uh, absolutely not. I'm still shocked to the core when I read that he persecuted and uh, took care of the condemnation of a brother in Christ only because he did uh, teach a, uh, a dogma that was not his. You know, in, in that way, uh, Calvin exalts himself. And uh, as I said in that video already, he makes himself Pope. A little one, but he makes himself a Pope. He makes himself and his belief system as the one and only to follow, where we should all follow just the Bible. So my point being is that when we go through this part of the history that Limborch is telling us here in this book, in the uh, introduction still, the first volume of of his two-volume book, The History of the Inquisition, um, that we have to take that uh, with a grain of salt, meaning that when a so-called Protestant, because I don't even dare calling Calvin a Protestant anymore after reading that, meaning a apostolic Bible-believing Christian, because then he wouldn't have done that, but when we read that these people do these persecutions, that has nothing to do with the Inquisition that we are going to learn from that the Roman Catholic Church initiated against the true Bible-believing Christians. Among those were also these reformers, like Calvin, even though that he had here and there another point of view, but he was hated by the Roman Catholic Church, let's make that sure. And not only him, but also the other people that we were reading about and that we will read about in the forthcoming reading right now. There were people in there like uh, Cranmer and Latimer and other people from the Anglican Church uh, who were not that uh, holy <laughs> as we thought uh, they actually were. And this book deals with that. But uh, the persecutions they did are in no way comparative to the persecutions they had to suffer or other Bible-believing, Jesus-following Christians had to suffer throughout the ages. I just wanted to make that sure before we go into the reading. Now we will continue on the, uh, on the top of page 71, as you see here, after we have left over from um, the reading that we read here about... Um, Calvin, and we are still uh, learning about Switzerland at that time. You know, uh, Basel and Geneva and uh, Zurich and uh, even uh, Austria, Vienna. We are reading about all these cities uh, north of Italy, uh, but heart of the Holy Roman Empire, as it was called for almost uh, for a thousand years until 1800 n until the end of the Napoleonic Wars. And we are now still reading about these cities here. So, as you can see highlighted here, at Basel, <coughs> at Basel also heresy was a crime punishable with death, since the Reformation, as appears from the treatment of the dead body of David George, an enthusiastical Anabaptist. Having left Holland, he went to Basel and set it there as one that was banished out of his country for the sake of his religion, propagating his own doctrines by letters, books and messengers in Holland. Uh, it, it's again what we read here, propagating his own doctrines. Yeah? And this is where all these people are in error. They should propagate the doctrines of the Bible and the Bible alone. Sola Scriptura, that's what it's all about. So we, we read here again and again about people who are propagating their own doctrine. And uh, Jesus said, 
that uh, the doctrine of men, or the Bible says that the doctrine of men is evil. Uh, it has nothing to do with the word of God. Our own doctrines are worth nothing. It's about the Bible and the Bible alone. So when this uh, person here, David George, propagates his own doctrine by letters, books and messengers in Holland, what does he do? He is trying to convince Bible-believing people to come over to his court and worship and teach the way that he teaches. And that is not correct. Okay? So the author continues, but his errors being discovered after his death, he was taken out of his grave and together with his books and pictures burned to ashes by order of the magistrates at the place of execution without the walls of Basel, May 13th, 1559. Now this of course reminds us of what happened with uh, Wycliffe, whose bones have been dug up 40 years after his death and burned and then grinded to powder and this powder thrown into a river over there in, uh, in Old England <coughs> for him to vanish exactly. So these are the same doings and I can assure you that his own doctrines uh, of David George that we read about here were probably not the doctrines of the then ruling Roman Catholic Church, otherwise that would not have been done. His opinions were first extracted from the printed books and manuscript papers found in his house, and he declared an arch-heretic. So, who declares him an arch-heretic? That must have been the Roman Catholic Church, because there was no other reigning at that time. And when they declare someone an arch-heretic, they have at least a different gospel than that of the Roman Catholic Church, which is not a Christian gospel, because the Roman Catholic Church comes out of Babylon. Now, Zurich also furnishes us with an instance of great cruelty towards an Anabaptist. A severe edict was published against him, in which there was penalty of a silver mark, about four shillings English money, set upon all such as should suffer themselves to be rebaptized, or should withhold baptism from their children. And it was further declared that those who openly opposed this order should be yet more severely treated. Accordingly, one Felix was drowned at Zurich upon the sentence pronounced by Zwinglius. In these four words, qui interum mergit mergatur, meaning in English, he that redips, let him be drowned. Yeah? Anna Baptist, baptize again, he that redips, let him be drowned. This happened in the year 1526. About the same time also, and since, there were some more of them put to death. From the same place also Ocinus was banished in his old age, in the depths of winter, together with his children, because he was an Arian and defended polygamy, if Beza's account of him be true. Lubinitius, a Polish Unitarian, was through the practices of the Calvinists banished with his brethren from Poland, his native country, and forced to leave several Protestant cities of Germany to which he fled for refuge, particularly Stettin, Frederikstadt and Hamburg, through the practices of the Lutheran divines who were against all toleration. This is an important part of the sentence. Through the practices of the Lutheran divines who were against all toleration. That means that they were first and for all against compromising. And Lutherans or not, I have to say, compromising the word of God is always wrong. So I don't know if these Lutherans really adhered to sola scriptura, because we know that Luther was not completely sola scriptura with a lot of his teachings, with teachings of the sacrament, with teaching of uh, child baptism and all that stuff that Luther did. That was not biblical at all. But through the practices of the Lutheran divines who were against all tolerism uh, or against all toleration, that means that when you have the true belief 
in the Bible, in the inerrant word of God, then of course you are against all toleration, against all compromises. So this uh, person fled from Poland into different cities in Germany because of the persecution and he was persecuted there also because they were against all compromises. At Hamburg he received the orders of the magistrates of the city to depart the place on his deathbed. And when his dead body was carried to Altenau, he be <coughs> to be in, uh, interned through the preach, uh, though the preachers could not, as they endeavored prevent his being buried in the, ch uh, in the church. Yet they did actually prevent the usual funeral honors being paid him. John Sylvanus, superintendent of the Church of Heidelberg, was put to death by order of Frederick Elector Palatine in 1571 being accused of Arianism. If we pass over into Holland, we shall also find that the reformers there were most of them the principles and measures of persecution, and managed their differences with that heat and fury as gave great advantages to the papists, their common enemies. Huh? Okay. We pass over into Holland, we shall also find that the reformers there were most of them in the principles and measures of persecution and managed their differences with that heat and fury as gave great advantages to the papists, their common enemies. When you are a Bible-believing Christian, meaning a reformer in this case, then you have one common enemy, that's right, the papists. Now, in the very instancy of the Reformation, the Lutherans and Calvinists condemned each other for their supposed heterodoxy in the affair of the sacrament and looked upon compliance and mutual toleration to be things intolerable. Now, this is again something that I have absolutely no understanding for, meaning that I can absolutely not accept this, even though, of course, it is an unchangeable historical fact that the Lutherans and the Calvinists condemned each other. You know, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, if I'm not mistaken, about people who adhere to, say that they adhere to Paul and other people who say that they adhere to Apollos. But we should not adhere neither to Paul nor to Apollos, but we should adhere to Jesus Christ. So the people here, the Lutherans and the Calvinists, they should not adhere to Luther, they should not adhere to Calvin, they should adhere to Jesus Christ. Only in Christ, in the truth, is real Christian unity, and nowhere else. Now, these differences were kept up principally by the clergy of each party. The Prince of Orange and States of Holland, who were heartily inclined to the Reformation, were not for confining their protection to any particular set of principles or opinions, but for granting an universal indulgence in all matters of religion, aiming at peace and mutual forbearance, and to open the Church as wide as possible for all Christians for unblameable lives, of unblameable lives of unblameable lives, whereas the clergy, being biased in their passions and inclinations for those matters, in whose writings they had been instructed, endeavoured with all their might to establish and conciliate authority to their respective opinions, aiming only at decisions and definitions, and shutting up the Church by limitations in many doubtful and disputable articles, so that the disturbances which were raised and the severities <coughs> which were used upon the account of religion proceeded from the bigotry of the clergy, contrary to the desire and intentions of the civil magistrate. Now what we have to understand here is when we read of the bigotry of the clergy, the clergy is the church, huh? like it says here, the church as wide open as possible, whereas the clergy being biased in their passions and inclinations for those matters, that clergy is the clergy of the ruling Roman Catholic Church at that time. Yeah? And they, as it says here, proceeded from the bigotry of the clergy, contrary to the desire and intentions of the civil magistrate, means that the state here had another opinion than the clergy at that time. But the Roman Catholic Church teaches that the spiritual is above the temporal, and that by that the Church 
has to rule the state. The part that makes the fourth beast of the Daniel's uh, of Daniel's prophecy and Daniel 2, for example, the <coughs> the so-called metal man or the beast of I think Daniel 7 it is, yeah, where you have these four beasts: Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. The fourth beast, exceedingly strong and different from all the others, that's where they differ, because they had a combination of state and church, something that did not happen in the other uh, old empires, where state and church were separate. They had their temporal rulers and they had their priesthood. But in Rome, that becomes one person, the Pontifex Maximus. And here, the bigotry of the clergy, contrary to the desire and intentions of the civil magistrate, means that the clergy here differed from the civil magistrate. So the civil magistrate has to be changed, I think. Now, before the ministers of the Reform Party were engaged in the controversy with Arminius, their zeal was continually exerting itself uh, against the Anabaptists, whom they declared to be excommunicated and cut off from the church and endeavored to convert by violence and force, prohibiting them from preaching under fines and banishing from their country upon account of their opinions. Again, on, uh, upon account of their opinions. It should never be about anybody's opinion. It should be about the word of God, the Bible and the Bible alone. But of course, because you have here another cult or another sect of the Anabaptists, and they were different from the other cults because of their opinion, well, they were persecuted. And this persecution is a persecution of the saints, even though that they had their own opinions instead of the opinions of the Bible. I cannot repeat that often enough to make that clear to you. Now, the author continues here, and, uh, and the better to color these proceedings. Some of them wrote in defense of, uh, in defense of persecution, or which is the same thing, against the toleration of any religion or opinions different from their own. Well, at least here they were correct. No compromises. And for the better support of orthodoxy, they would have the synods ordain that all church officers should renew their subscriptions and uh, to the confession of catechism every year, that hereby they might be better known who had changed their sentiments and differed from the received faith. So what we are reading here about is actually taking into action, what I said before. When the magistrate differs from the clergy, then the magistrate has to be worked off. This is what they are doing. Before the ministers of the Reform Party were engaged in the controversy with Arminius, their zeal was continually exerting itself against the Anabaptists, whom they declared to be excommunicated and cut off from the church. So, when we read here, uh, and for the better support of orthodoxy, they would have the synods ordain that all church officers should renew their subscriptions for the confession and catechism every year, that thereby they might be the better, uh, they might the better know who had changed their sentiments and differed from the received faith. Received faith we are talking about here is the Roman Catholic faith, not the received faith of the Bible. Now, this practice was perfectly agreeable to the Geneva discipline, Calvin himself, as has been shown, being in judgment for persecuting heretics, and Beza having wrote a treatise in 1600 to prove the lawfulness of punishing them. Well, I do not agree with what Beza wrote here, because we are not to punish people who have different belief systems only because of their belief system. This book was translated from the Latin into the Low Dutch language by Bogerman, afterwards president of the Synod of Dort, and published with the dedication and recommendation of it to the magistrates. The consequence of this was that a very severe placards uh, were published against the Anabaptists in Friesland and Groningen, 
whereby they were forbidden to preach, and all persons prohibited from letting their houses and grounds to them, under the penalty of a large fine or confinement of bread and water for fourteen days. If they offended the third time, they were to be banished the city and the jurisdiction thereof. Whosoever was discovered to rebaptize any person should forfeit twenty dollars, and upon a second conviction be put to bread and water, and then be banished. Unbaptized children were made incapable of inheriting, and if any married out of the Reformed Church, he was declared incapable of inheriting any estate, and the children made illegitimate. illegitimate. Now this is exactly what we uh, experience today. The Roman Catholic Church absolutely orders to baptize children, which is unbiblical, because baptism is an outward sign of an inner change. The change that I found to the belief of the true word of God, that I found Jesus Christ in my life. Baptism is only an outward sign of that. Um, but the Roman Catholic Church, of course, considers baptism one of their sacraments, one of their works. And without these works, you cannot be saved. That's what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. And here, when we read that unbaptized children were made incapable of inheriting, that means that when you became the father or the mother of a church, and decided not to baptize your child because you adhere to the Bible, and you know that a child of a few months, or weeks, or days, or even a few years old, cannot make up his own mind on God, and you say, well, I'm not going to baptize that child because of that, then it would be impossible for that child to inherit anything. Because the Roman Catholic Church does not accept children who were not baptized. And if any married out of the Reformed Church, well, that's the same thing actually here, even though it is said here about the Reformed Church, that's the same with the Roman Catholic Church. When you want to marry outside of the Roman Catholic Church, you need a license. You need a marriage license. You need a marriage license from the state. Otherwise, you can't get married. He was declared incapable of inheriting any estate and the children made illegitimate, illegitimate. Meaning, you could do whatever you want if you did not adhere to the so-called Reformed Church here, that rules here, uh, whether they call that, and I don't think that this is uh, uh, any really Reformed Church, I think this is more the Reformed Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> yeah? Then you were incapable of inheriting any estate and your children were made illegitimate. But the controversy that made the greatest noise and produced the most remarkable effects was that carried on between the Calvinists and Arminians. Jacobus Arminius, one of the professors of divinity at Leiden, disputing in his turn about the doctrine of predestination, advanced several things differing from the opinions of Calvin on his on this article, and was in a few months after warmly opposed by Gomarus, his college, who held, quote, that it was appointed by an eternal decree of God, who amongst mankind shall be saved, and who shall be damned. Well, unquote, this is predestination. It was appointed by an eternal decree of God, who amongst mankind shall be saved, and who shall be damned. You know, we don't choose God, God chooses us, right? So it is God who chooses. It is God who chooses who is to be saved and who is to be damned. This was indeed the sentiment of most of the clergy of the United Provinces, who therefore endeavoured to run down Arminius and his doctrine with the greatest zeal in their private conversations, public disputes, and in their very sermons to their congregations, charging him with innovations and of being a follower of the ancient heretical monk Pelagius.
whereas the government was more inclinable to Arminius' scheme as being less rigid in its nature and more intelligible by the people, and endeavoured all they could to prevent these differences of the clergy from breaking out into an open quarrel to the disturbance of the public peace. But the ministers of the predestinarian party would enter into no treaty for peace. The remonstrants were the objects of their furious zeal, whom they called Mamelukes, devils and plagues, animating the magistrates to extirpate and destroy them, and crying out from the pulpits, we must, go th uh, we must go through thick and thin, without fearing to stick in the mire. We know what Elijah did to Baal's priests, and when the time drew near for the election of new magistrates, they prayed to God for such men as would be zealous even to blood, though it were the, to cost the whole trade of their cities. Unquote. They also accused them of keeping up a correspondence with the Jesuits and Spaniards and of a design to betray their country to them. These proceedings gave great disturbance to the magistrate, especially as many of the clergy took great liberties with them, furiously inveighing against them in their sermons as enemies to the church and persecutors as liberties and free thinkers who hated the sincere ministers of God and endeavoured to turn them out of their office. This conduct, together with their obstinate refusal of all measures of accommodation and peace with the remonstrance to incense uh, so incensed the magistrates that in several cities they suspended some of the warmest and most seditious of them and prohibited them from the public exercises of their ministerial function, particularly Gesellius of Rotterdam and afterwards Ro uh, Roseus, minister at The Hague, for endeavouring to make a schism in the church and exhorting the people to break off communion with their brethren. Being thus discarded, they assumed to themselves the name of the persecuted church and met together in private houses, absolutely refusing all communion with the remonstrant ministers and party, in spite of all the attempts made use of to reconcile and unite them. Now, why did I highlight the sentence, you probably ask yourself, and well, then I'm going to read it again and you will understand probably without me going into any comment. Being thus discarded, the author says, they assumed to themselves the name of the persecuted church and met together in private houses, not open church buildings, absolutely refusing all communion with remonstrant ministers and party, meaning no compromise, in spite of all the attempts made use of to reconcile and unite them. So, this is exactly what the Bible says how we should worship. We should not go to big churches, mega churches, congregations and all that stuff. We should not have communion with people with other belief systems but separate, but separate ourselves and this is exactly what they did here. So I still did a little bit of a comment but it was quite short. Okay. Now, what the ministers of the Contra-Monstrant uh, Contra Party aimed at was the holding a national council, which at length, after a long opposition, was agreed to in the Assembly of the States General, who appointed Dort for the place of the meeting. Prince Maurice of Orange, the Stadtholder, effectually prepared matters for holding the said assembly, and as he declared himself openly for the contra-monstrant party, not <coughs> for that he was of their opinions in religions, being rather inclined of those of Arminius, but because he thought them to be best friends to his family, he took care that the council would, should consist of such persons as were well affected to them. In order to this, His Excellency changed the government of most of the towns of Holland, deposed those magistrates 
who were of the remonstrant persuasion, or that favoured them in the business of the toleration, and filled up their places with contramonstrants, I mean contra, actually, yeah, contramonstrants, or such as promoted their interests, making use of the troops of the states to obviate all opposition. This is persecution, huh? making use of the troops of the state to obviate all opposition, using the civil power to push through your ecclesiastical power. The consequence of this was the imprisonment of several great men of the remonstrant persuasion, such as the advocate Old Barnevelt, Grotius and others, and the suspension or total depreciation of a considerable number of the remonstrant clergy, such as Wittenbogard and, uh, at the, of The Hague, Grovin Kiovius of Rotterdam, Grievius and others by particular synods met together for that purpose and to prepare things and appoint persons for the ensuing national one at Dort. The persons fixed on were generally the most violent of the contramonstrant party, and who had publicly declared that they would not enter into communion with those who differed from them, nor agree to any terms of moderation and peace. There were also several foreign divines summoned, uh, summoned to this council, who were most of them in the Calvinistic scheme, and professed enemies to the Armenians. The lay commissioners also, so that is again the state people, the lay commissioners also who were chosen by the states, yeah, where most of them were partial contramonstrants, and two or three of them who seemed more impartial than the others were hardly suffered to speak, and if they did, were presently suspected and presented by letters set to the state and Prince Maurice at the Hague at persons that favoured the remonstrance, which was then considered a crime against the government. Very important sentence. Insomuch that by these insinuations they were in danger of being stripped of all their employments. Uh, as persons that favoured the remonstrance, which was then considered as a crime against the government. A lot of things are considered today a crime against the government. When you adhere to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, you are today supposed to be a terrorist. Because when you're not with us, you're against us, right? But why should I be with an antichrist government when I could when I could be with Christ? To me that's not even a choice. But here we see just the same thing. That person that favored the remonstrance which was considered as a crime against the government. And so much that by these insinuations they were in danger of being stripped of all their employments. The first session and opening of this venerable assembly was November 13th, 1618. So that's when the Thirty Year War started, remind you. The Thirty Year War ran between 1618 and 1648 and was a genocide against mostly Germans but also Dutch people, mostly Germans, Protestants. It was a religious, it was a counter-reformation war. And this assembly opened on November 13, 1618. John Rogerman was chosen president of it, the same worthy and moderate divine who had before translated into Low Dutch Beza's treatise to prove the lawfulness of punishing heretics with a preface recommendatory to the civil magistrate, chosen not by the whole synod, but by the Low Countries divines only, the foreigners not being allowed any share in the election. At the fifth session, the remonstrants petitioned the Synod that a competent number of their friends might have leave to appear before them, and that the citation might be... <laughs> 
this is uh, this is difficult uh, and that the citation might be sent to the whole bodies I, I, I don't know that word be sent and not to a single person oh, yeah, okay this is two words okay I'm sorry <laughs> get this again at the fifth session the remonstrants petitioned the synod that a competent number of their friends might have le uh, might have might have leave to appear before them and that the citation might be sent to the whole body and not to any single person to the end that they might be at liberty to send such as they should judge best qualified to defend their cause and particularly insisted that uh, Grovinkibovius and Goulart might be of the number one would have thought that so equitable a request should have been readily granted. But they were told that it could not be allowed that the remonstrance should pass for a distinct body, or make any deputation of persons in their common name to uh, treat of their affairs. And agreeable to this declaration, the summons that were given out were not sent to the remonstrance as a body or part of the synod, but to such particular persons as the synod thought it to choose out of them, which was little less than citing them as criminals before a body of men, which chiefly consisted of their professed adversaries. So instead of condemning the whole group of the remonstrants, they just pick out a few persons and persecute them. When they first appeared in the synod, and Episcopius, in the name of the rest of them, talked of in, uh, entering into a regular conference about the points of difference, uh, of the points in difference. They were immediately given to understand that no conference was intended, but that their only business was to deliver their sentiments and humbly to wait for the judgment of the council concerning them. So what do we read here, actually? That when they came to make their point before the synod, they were told, we don't care what you say, the only thing that you have to do is to agree that you differ from our opinion and our dogma. This is like the interrogation the Inquisition started with, we, as we will probably see later on in this book. Yeah? So when they first appeared in the Synod and uh, Episcopius, in the name of them, in the name of all uh, of them, talked to and trying uh, to entering into a regular conference about the points of difference, meaning let us talk about this, they were immediately given to understand that no conference was intended. No, we don't even care about what you say, but that their only business was to deliver their sentiments and humbly to wait for the judgment of the council concerning them. Now Episcopius, in the name of this brethren, declared that they did not own the synod for their lawful judges, because most of that body were their avowed enemies and fomenters and promoters of the unhappy schism amongst them, upon which they were immediately reprimanded by the president for impeaching and arraigning their authority and presuming to prescribe laws to those whom the states generals had appointed for their judges. The divines of Geneva added upon his uh, uh, added upon this head, quote, that if people obstinately refuse to submit to the lawful determinations of the church, there then remain two methods to be used against them. The one, that the civil magistrate might stretch out his arm of compulsion. The other, that the church might exert her power in order to separate and cut off by a public sentence those who violated the laws of God. I quote, the laws of God. I think that we are talking here about the God of the Roman Catholic Church, right? And that they say that whether the civil power or the spiritual power both have the right to convert these people and to condemn these people and to persecute these people after many debates on this head between the synod and the remonstrants who adhered to their resolution of not owning the synod for their judges they were turned out of it by bogemen 
the president with great insolence and fury, to the high dissatisfaction of many of the foreign divines. After the quote unquote holy synod, yeah, now how can this synod be holy other, uh, other than God sanctifying it? And I am not aware of God any uh, any time at any time sanctified any holy quote unquote holy synod, yeah, you know. <coughs> so it is not holy in the biblical sense, just that we understand that correctly. After the Holy Synod had thus rid themselves of the remonstrance, whose learning and good sense would have rendered them exceeding troublesome to this assembly, they proceeded to fix the faith, and as they had no opposition to fear, and were almost all of one side, at least in the main points, they agreed in their articles and canons, and in their sentence against the remonstrant clergy who had been cited to appear before them, which was to this effect. Now follows a lengthy quote, how they condemn the remonstrants. Quote, they besieged and charged, in the name of Christ, all and singular the ministers of the churches throughout the United Netherlands, that they forsake and abandon the well-known five articles of the remonstrance as being false and no other than secret magazines of errors. And whereas some who are gone out from amongst us, calling themselves remonstrants, have out of private views and ends unlawfully violated the discipline and government of the church, have not only trumped up old errors but hammered out new ones too have blackened and rendered odious the established doctrine of the church with impudent slanders and calamities, calumnies without end or measure, have filled all places with scandal, discord, scruples, troubles and of conscience, all which heinous offences ought to be restrained and punished in clergymen with the severest censures. Therefore this national synod, this holy synod, as they called it in the beginning, being assured of its own authority, not the authority of God, remind you, but being assured of its own authority, doth hereby declare and determine that those ministers who have acted in the churches as heads of factions and teachers of errors are guilty and convicted of having violated our holy religion, having made a rent in the unity of the church, and given very great scandal. And as for, and as for those who were cited before this synod, that they are, besides, guilty of intolerable disobedience to the commands of the venerable synod, for all which reasons the synod doth in the first place discharge the aforesaid cited persons from all ecclesiastical administrations and deprive them of their offices, judging them likewise unworthy of any academical employment. And as for the rest of the remonstrant clergy, they are hereby recommended to the provincial synods, classes and consistories, who are to, t uh, who are to take the utmost care that the patrons of the errors be prudently discovered, that all obstinate, clamorous and factious disturbers of the church under their jurisdiction be forthwith deprived of their ecclesiastical and academical offices, and they, and they, this, uh, and, and they, the said province. Uh, provincial, sorry, and they, the said provincial synods, are therefore extorted to take a particular care that they admit none into the ministry who shall refuse to subscribe or promise to preach the doctrine asserted in these synodical decrees, and that they suffer no uh, suffer none to continue in the ministry by whose public dissent the doctrine which has been so unanimously approved by all the members of the Synod, the harmony of the clergy and the peace of the quote-unquote church, may be again disturbed. And they most earnestly and humbly beseech their gracious God that their high might... Uh, that their high mightiness... 
mightinesses, may suffer and ordain this wholesome doctrine, which the Synod has faithfully expressed, to be maintained alone and in its purity within, the, uh, within their provinces, and restrained turbulent and unruly spirits, and may likewise put in execution the sentence pronounced against the above-mentioned persons, and ratify and confirm the decrees of the Synod by their authority." Unquote. Now the states readily obliged them in this Christian and charitable request, for as soon as the synod was concluded, the old advocate Barnevelt was beheaded, who had been a zealous and hearty friend to the remonstrants and their principles, and Grotius condemned to perpetual imprisonment. And because the cited ministers would not promise wholly and always to abstain from the exercise of their ministerial functions, the states passed a resolution of the banishing of them, on pain, if they did not submit to it, of being treated as disturbers of the public peace, or terrorists as we call them today. And though they only begged a respite of the sentence for a few days to put, uh, to put their affairs in order, and to provide themselves with a little money to support themselves and families in their banishment, even this was unmercifully denied them, and they were hurried away next morning by four o'clock, as though they had been enemies to the religion and liberties of their country. Speaking of persecution, you are not even allowed to pack a few things, take up money and take care for your family when you are banished? No. Hold out in the morning at four o'clock, because you have been made enemies to the religion and liberties of their country, the religion being the Roman Catholic religion. Such was the effect of this famous Presbyterian Synod, who behaved themselves as tyrannical towards their brethren as any prelatical council whatsoever could do, and to the honour of the Church of England it must be said that they owned their synodical power and, uh, and conquered by their deputies Carlton, Bishop of Landers, Hall, Devenant and Ward, in condemning the remonstrants, in excommunicating and depriving them, and turning them out of their churches, and in establishing both the discipline and doctrines of Geneva in the Netherlands. For after the council was ended, the remonstrants were everywhere driven out of their churches, and prohibited from holding any private meetings, and many of, uh, of them banished on this very account. The reader will find a very particular relation uh, of these trans uh, transactions in the learned Gerard Branch's history of the Reformation of the Low Countries, which I must refer him. So here the author makes note of uh, a book written by Gerard Brands called The History of the Reformation of the Low Countries, meaning uh, Netherlands, um, to which he must refer them because he doesn't go very much into this part right here, which I can understand. Now, if we look into our own country, we shall find numerous proofs of the same anti-Christian spirit and practice. Even our first reformers, who had seen the flames which the papists had kindled against their brethren, yet lighted fires themselves to consume those who differed from them. Now it becomes interesting. Cranmer's hands were stained with the blood of several. He had a share in the prosecution and condemnation of that pious and excellent martyr John Lambert, and consented to the death of Anne Askew, who were burned for denying the corporal presence which, through Cranmer, then believed, he saw afterwards reason to deny. In the year 1549, Joan Boucher was condemned for some enthusiastical opinions about Christ, and delivered over to the secular power. The sentence being returned to the council, King Edward VI was moved to sign a warrant for her being burned, but could not prevail with, it, uh, with to do it. 
Cranmer endeavoured to persuade him by such arguments as rather silenced than satisfied the young king. So he set his hand to the warrant with tears in his eyes, saying to the archbishop that, he, uh, that if he did wrong, since it was in submission to his authority, he should answer for it to God. Though this struck Cranmer, Cranmer with horror, yet he at last put the sentence in execution against her. About two years after, one George van Baer, a Dutchman, was accused before them for saying that God the Father was only God and that Christ was not very God. And though he was a person of a very holy life, yet because he would not abjure, he was condemned for heresy and burned in Smithfield. The archbishop himself was afterwards burned for heresy which, as Fox observed, many looked on a just retaliation from the providence of God for the cruel severities he had used towards others. So, this last sentence here I find very intriguing. We were just reading about the bishop Cranmer, one who we always mention as one of the finest reformers, who here takes care that the King Edward VI, who was a very young king, he was just in his, uh, in his teenager years, uh, had to sign different death sentences because of a difference of opinion in ecclesiastical uh, teaching from the Archbishop Cranmer. Now we know that Cranmer himself was burnt for heresy, meaning he was himself uh, being understood of being a heretic of the Roman Catholic Church, of course, that is. Yeah? Being a reformer, being a Bible believer. But when he is a Bible believer and a follower of Jesus Christ, why does he make the king write death sentences about people who have another opinion, who teach another gospel? Well, pointed out that they teach another gospel, but you don't have to kill those people. This last sentence, therefore, is very important. The archbishop himself was afterwards burnt for heresy which, as Fox observed, many looked, on a just uh, many looked on a just retaliation from the providence of God for the cruel severities he had used towards others. Meaning that this Archbishop Cranmer, who put other people to death, some through the stake, apparently, was himself put to the stake, which people like Fox observed is retaliation for what he did himself. Meaning the Bible says it in this way who kills by the sword shall be killed by the sword. God was taking care of Cranma. When you get people burned, you are getting burned. This is what the sentence actually says in short and a little bit more modern English than we understand this year. <laughs> okay. The controversy about the popish habits was one of the first that arose amongst the English reformers. Cranmer and Ridley were zealous, were zealous for the use of them, whilst other very pious and learned divines were for laying them aside as the badges of idolatry and antichrist. Amongst these was Dr. Hooper, nominated to the bishopric of Gloucester, but because he refused to be consecrated in the old vestments, he was, by order of the council, first silenced and then confined to his own house, and afterwards, by Cranmer's means, committed to the fleet prison, where he continued several months. Now, in the beginning of Queen Elizabeth's reign, in uh, 1559, and we are speaking about um, yeah, Queen Elizabeth here, who was a Protestant Queen of England, who survived the Babington plot and other conspiracies against her life, and also, of course, in 1588, uh, the Spanish Armada, uh, this Queen Elizabeth that we are talking about, her son, if I'm not mistaken, being James I, 
the one who gave us the King James Bible, in the beginning of Queen Elizabeth's reign in 1559, an act passed for the uniformity of common prayer and service in the church and administration of the sacraments, by which the queen and bishops were empowered to ordain such ceremonies and worship as they should think for the honor of God and the edification of his church. This act was rigorously pressed and great severities used to such as could not comply with it. Parker, who was Archbishop of Canterbury, made the clergy subscribe to use the prescribed rites and habits and cited before him many of the most famous divines who scrupled them and would allow none to be presented to livings or preferred in the church without the entire conformity. He summoned the whole body of the London pastors and curates to appear before him at Lambeth, and immediately suspended 37 who refused to subscribe to the unity of apparel, and signified to them that within three months they should be totally deprived if they would not conform so that many churches were shut up, and though the people were ready to mutiny for want of ministers, yet the archbishop was deaf to all their, uh, to all their complaints, and in his great goodness and piety was resolved they should have no sacraments or sermons without the surplus and the cap. And in order to prevent all opposition to church tyranny, the Star Chamber published a decree for sealing up the press and prohibiting any person to print or publish any book against the Queen's injunctions or against the meaning of them. This decree was signed by the bishops of Canterbury and of London. Now, this brings us in this reading to almost an hour and I will stop here and next time we will continue with reading about the reign of uh, Queen Elizabeth, and as you can already see here on page 79, King James I, who brought us the King James Bible, who was bred up in the Kirk in the Church of Scotland. Interesting to use the word Kirk here, you know, that you have, of course, as a, is an old Scottish word uh, for the church. So almost an hour gone and we have come into protestant England now and see how their persecutions have been made by even people who we call reformers, who we call protestants and who we always defend against the Roman Catholic Church. But on the other hand we should also see that even these people, like Cranmer as we have just learned, persecuted other people until death. And that is just not a Christian act. And with that, I want to leave it for the reading of today. Leave you to your own studies. And thank you for watching and listening to my work here. That comes through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And I hope to see you next time for the next reading of A History of the Inquisition from Pat, uh, from Patrick von Limborg from 1692. Until then, Jogla 66 from Hour of the Truth says, God bless you, signing off and bye-bye.